Okay. So it's a pleasure for me to come all the way from Boston to, to come here. And I'm really excited to be here today. And, and like Professor Zimper said, um, just to have a discussion. Uh, I'll be talking about a lot of the elements of storytelling and how do we apply that to the scientific method and scientific storytelling and for writing a paper. But there's these examples, in paper, whether, whatever the medium, whether it's paper or video, there's still some tenets that need to be uh, su subscribed. And those are, tenets are based off the Gustav Freitag's um, dramatic arc. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, it's, uh, in academia, it's difficult to, uh, everyone knows about the publisher parish and collecting data and results. And then it's a challenge sometimes to control the message. So in 2013, I uh, wrote a book called The Art of Scientific Storytelling. Um, and I didn't know about the reception. I think at the time I was at Harvard Medical School and we were just having a hard time writing papers. Because at that time in 2012, between 2009, eight to about 2012, there was a, a change in, si in the biomedical science uh, workforce where instead of just being a chemist, uh, then the chemists started working with biologists and new fields called biological chemistry started working together and all the discoveries and made in the high, high impact journals of nature and science and, and Lancet, they were all done through interdisciplinary work. So we needed a new language and part of that is uh, using scientific storytelling. That's what we use to start connecting and bridging different uh, fields. And so it took me a while to publish my first paper at, at Harvard Medical School. It was about seven years. And I learned a valuable lesson. You know, I, I learned that sometimes I was waiting for that perfect story, that perfect experiment. Oh, one experiment led to another experiment and to another act. So instead of a five acts, it was a sixth and a seventh and an eighth and a ninth. Then I realized that it's better to just publish early and often. And then as you go through the publishing process, you become better and better at it. And then you can still take your shot at publishing in the high impact journals. And so uh, m many of you may already know what is a story. But if we had to distill it down to two words, what would that be? Anyone? What, what is, does a story must essential to a story? What's the essential part of a story? that you must have? Yes, the conflict. And if you have conflict, what must you have? Uh, close, close. What's that word we're looking for? If you have conflict, you need the resolution. Yes, yes, great storytellers here. And so with this conflict resolution, you could distill a lot of the storytelling down to conflict resolution. But along with that, there's so many stories, so much more than that as well. It's a logical series of events. And typically, some of the, the basic stories are centered on a protagonist. So today, we'll focus on the protagonistic aspect of scientific storytelling. And in your protagonist, whatever, how, whoever, however you define your protagonist, or when you're writing, doing a story in video, whether paper or print, um, or through audio, you really need to identify your protagonist, because that really helps drive that story and, and you allow you to follow the action of that story as well. And so what is a, a very basic, basic definition of a hypothesis? Like if we had to d distill it down to like two words. Nothing fancy. I know we're in Switzerland, very smart and intellectual people here. In America, we, we kind of dumb things down a little bit. So if we had to dumb it down, water it down very much, what would it be like? What would be a definition of a hypothesis? What was that? Data. Yeah, you, you, you're looking at data, but do you really know what's going on with your hypothesis? An assumption. An assumption, yes, yes, yes. And, and you have some facts, right? It's not like we don't know anything, right? We're scientists, we're in the field, we're journalists, we're media specialists, so we do have a feeling and a sense of what to have, but we don't really know, right? And so with this, it's just an educated guess. And so when I started doing this method at, at Harvard Medical School, the, uh, 
one of the deans pulled me into the office and said, how can this be possible? You know, science is one area and the humanities in the, in the other. And those two, there's a chasm that doesn't bridge since the Renaissance period. And, and I just listened and I, and I listened. And, and then, but that dean helped me think a little bit more deeply about what we were doing with scientific storytelling. And so at that point, I, you know, I went back to the drawing board and I, and I kind of thought, you know, if we had to distill scientific research down to hypothesis validation. So a lot of just scientific papers, you have an assumption, you're guessing at something, an educated guess, and then we want to validate that. And that's how you're going to publish a, a manuscript, or publish you know, a story, or whether it be a, a video. You'll need to validate that hypothesis. But if a story, if you distill the story down to conflict resolution, then all of a sudden, um, if we set these two equal to each other, then all of a sudden we can, uh, when we get stuck writing our, our scientific and publishing our scientific research, we can implement the elements of narrative craft, conflict resolution, and scientific storytelling to help that. And now in my role as um, uh, associate dean at Boston College and director of the pre-health program and director of the gateway program for scholars and STEM, you know, we work about, with about 5,000 students, and my job is just to be a storyteller, tell their stories and for them to help them to get into medical school, find their purpose, their journey in their life, and to help advise them so that they can find their unique purpose. Um, and so I use that, so I bring in elements of hypothesis and validation and say, what's the evidence that you have to, to go in this career? You know, or if you don't have it, how do you, you know, get that, get that evidence so that when you put your resume out, then you'll, people will see your story. So similar to the Fried Tags uh, uh, dramatic arc, I did this in, um, I presented, my first presentation of, of scientific storytelling was in 2012. And at that time, I presented in front of, uh, 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 it was uh, Gerhard Wagner's um, uh, bio, biochemist and biophysicist group at Harvard Medical School. And he studied here at the ETH in Zurich. And so, and he loves, uh, he's German, but he loves everything Swiss. Uh, and his wife is also Swiss. And so uh, he, um, I, I presented in his lab, but I used the Freitag method. But then the, all the biophysicists there say, well, it doesn't make sense to use Freitag because you start in one plane and you end on the same plane. So then I had to use a different medium. And are there any chemists in the room or biochemists that might recognize this? Or anyone from a biology class? It's the energy of activation. So for every reaction to happen in molecules and thousands and thousands of reactions happen every second in your body, it's an energy barrier. So once it crosses a certain energy barrier, and then it'll, it'll go to a different state. And based off of this, this is, uh, so we just modified Freitag's uh, um, a dramatic arc, so we start off with a hypothesis, increasing tension points, t tension one, two, three, experiments one, two, three, Climax, um, validation, hypothesis, resolve. And so when you're doing research, whether it's a manuscript or a video or you're writing a story, how, how, how do you start? Where, where, where do you start? Where, 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 how do you start? Besides putting your name down or typing your name or... How do you get started? There's no right or wrong answers. A lot of these answers aren't right or wrong because storytelling can be done in all different types of ways. So, so when you first start, what do you normally do? The status quo. The status quo, find out what's already known. Yes, like the exposition part for the fire text there, yes. Someone else mentioned something over here? Structure, oh, very good, very good. And anyone else? And structure is very good because without that, then you'll, you, need, you need somewhere, it's almost like a road map. You need somewhere to go. So if you're going from here to uh, some place like in Germany called Lapheim, you probably need a look at your GPS. And I did that with Professor Zimper yesterday. And we can see where we would, we would go if we wanted to go that route. Um, anyone else? Oh, something new about it, right? You define something new. And so in typical manuscripts, 
you'll have a title, abstract, figures, results, and discussion, and intro. And so it doesn't really matter how you get started. The most important thing, what I found, working with thousands of people with their stories, um, whether it's in science or in business, what we find out is to get started. The biggest thing is to get started. Because if you start off with the title or an abstract, an abstract is nothing but a summary. You might write a short summary, a paragraph of what could happen. And then you might have your figures, which is, which is your data. And uh, you also have a results section that you might write out in discussion intro. So it doesn't seem to matter where you start, but it's an iterative process. So if you do an, uh, your scientific research video, then you would probably have multiple rounds of edits, and you might have to reshoot certain things. It's never really done uh, perfect on the first try. And so what I recommend to uh, most of the people is uh, when they're doing their research project, I, I think that it's important to start off with a title, right? Because someone mentioned, a young man here mentioned structure. But even with that structure, how do you summarize what you have, your video that you're going to make that might be a documentary of two hours? How do you bring, have that, distill that down to seven seconds? So you can tell that to someone else, to a producer, what your video is about in seven seconds. You have a manuscript that you worked seven years on. How do you explain that in seven seconds so that you, know, you might want to submit a research grant? And you have only seven seconds in the elevator to talk. Some people say 30 seconds to a minute. But what I found is really about 10 seconds. And then after that, you may lose someone's attention. So you really need to capture that quickly. And so if we start off with a title, um, but we want a title, a special title, a scientific storytelling title, a title that has the whole story in it. Right? How would we do that? How would we distill a whole story into seven seconds? And that's where we'll just think of it as a conclusion. So if you think of your title, what's your conclusion? And someone mentioned the novelty. What's so novel about it? You kind of mention that novelty, but you put it in a context. And so what we found and what we recommend is to have a storytelling title where You'll have a protagonist, it's the main character, antagonist, something that um, doesn't change, it stays the same, and the protagonist is what changes. You have conflict, scene, resolution, and stakes. And stakes is nothing but your research impact. So how many pe people here have seen The Lion King? Can you raise your hands? Well, it's quite impressive. The, uh, that day in 2012, um, there were uh, about 25 scientists, about 22 of them male, and they were from Europe. And none of the men at that time saw The Lion King. And I was completely shocked. And I said, well, you know, everyone's seen The Lion King. They're like, no, I don't watch it. I said, didn't you have kids? Yeah, they watched it, but I didn't watch it. And I just didn't understand. But it makes sense to be in a room full of storytellers where you have seen the movie The Lion King, one of the best movies ever, one of my favorites. So, if we had to distill The Lion King down to seven seconds, say you didn't have time to watch the whole movie, what, what, and what would we do? How would we summarize The Lion King? So if we had to do it, we can just identify the protagonist, antagonist, conflict, scene, resolution, and stakes, and that's all the whole movie within seven seconds. So here we have Simba, the protagonist, defeats in the form of all the resolution in the form of a verb, Scar is the antagonist, African kingdom is the scene, uh, circle of life is the stakes, the research impact. Um, and yeah, and so you have protagonist, antagonist, uh, then it says uh, uh, African kingdom is the conflict, the resolution is defeat, and African, African kingdom is also the scene and the circle of life of the stakes. And so if we just take for an example um, The Lion King, and we'll break that down, and then we'll start breaking down different sciences, uh, science pieces, and we'll see how we adapt the same um, logical uh, narrative that uh, The Lion King used. So if we have the hypothesis, Simba defeats Scar to take his rightful place as king in the Pride Lands of Africa and continue the circle of life, then that's your hypothesis. Simba leaves the, the Pride, he meets Timon and Pumbaa. 
And so with your protagonist and your antagonist, I liked how Professor Zimper said he brought in someone else, right? You have your protagonist antagonist, you bring in the third antagonist. And that antagonist helps to judge. But here you have Timon and Pumbaa. Now, does Timon and Pumbaa support your hypothesis? Of, remember the hypothesis, Simba defeats Scar to take his rightful place as king in the Pride Lands of Africa and continues his circle of life. In the beginning of the film, do Simba and, I mean, does, do Timon and Pumbaa support that hypothesis? No, absolutely not. Because it's Kuma Matata, you stay here, we let's eat some worms. And so, typically, if you have evidence in the scientific field and your first experiment is against what you proposed, it doesn't mean that your overall hypothesis is wrong. What it means is that you need another experiment. So what was the second experiment in The Lion King? What was the next uh, the tension point with another antagonist, another act actor that came onto the stage? What was, who was the next one? What was her name? Does anyone remember? Any Lion King experts? Nala, Nala yes. There's always a Lion King expert in every audience. <laughs> There's always. So we have Nala. And what does Nala tell Simba? Do we remember? Does Nala support the hypothesis? Someone said yes. And, and why? What's the evidence? Remember, if we're doing scientific research and putting things in a scientific method, what's the evidence that Nala presents um, to Simba for her to for this interaction to support the hypothesis. What is the evidence? Does anyone remember? Well, one of the things that she said was, well, you have to go back. You know, you have to take your rightful place as king, and you need to go back. And so, so that supports the hypothesis. And the next tension point, there was a, a monkey. Does anyone remember the name of the monkey? Rafiki, yes, we have more than one Lion King expert here. So we have Rafiki, and with Rafiki, he sees his father, and he finds out what he needs to do, battles with Scar. Now, if you end your film right with your highest important result, like in science and biochemistry, if you have the crystal structure of, of a large ribosome or of a cell membrane, you see how it works over an antibody that binds to a viral particle, and you see that. Is that enough? That's your climax. Why, why don't we stop at the climax? Why do, what, why do we need that resolution? Why do we need the denouement? Why do we need that? Why couldn't we just stop right after Simba defeats Scar? Why couldn't the movie just end? We want to know what happens, right? We want to bring it back to that context. And we want to bring it back to the pride of rock. So scientists are just, and, and are just like um, uh, children, how we want to see what happens at the end. Scientists want to see what happens. So at the end of this story, um, a symbol defeats Scar, and then all the animals come back, light is. And then here you have pride rock. And he's at pride rock. Now, is that to now that when he's at Pride Rock, Simba, does that fulfill the, complete the hypothesis? What's the evidence that we need to fulfill the hypothesis? And that's when we know you're done with your manuscript, your video, and it's done to, and then it's time to publish. How do we know to end the story? What needs to happen? Yes, you need the circle of life because that's part of your hypothesis and that's part of your research stakes. And so that's where we, so the, his daughter is raised and then that's how you have the circle of life. And so this is my circle of life when I published my paper. It took seven years to, to do this. So I centered my story on EI5CTD, which is my protagonist. That's this molecule here, it binds to EIF1, similar to my Timon and Pumbaa. It didn't give me really clear results. Then I said, okay, I have EIF5 here, and everywhere is painted red and yellow. It binds to a different uh, antagonist called EIF2 beta. And so do I listen to Nala on figure two, or do I listen to Timon and Pumbaa on figure one? I had no idea. I wanted to publish my paper. Professor uh, Wagner was like, well, we need to find out. We can't just publish. We need to know 
which one is the preferential one. So we did isothermal titration calorimetry. And, and all we did was see how much the heat was released. When proteins bind together, they release heat in a nice curve, just like this. And we could only see that for 5 and 2 beta. But for EI5 and EI4, the reaction didn't generate enough heat. That means that the reaction wasn't that strong. And so if that's the case, then I need to listen to Nala, and I disregard Timon and Pumba for now. And then I, we put it into a biochemistry soup, and with all the EIF5 and all these proteins together, and we can see that um, this place where we interact is actually important. And then we tested it in yeast, uh, and then we tested it further again in yeast. And this, if we count up the years, it was three to four years to get here, the four, four to five years to get here, and uh, around the fifth year at this point, the sixth year, and I was done. I was ready to publish after the sixth year. But my collaborator and I said, no, Raphael, if this is true, if the results you see here, we should be able to predict what happens next. And, and I didn't want him to do that experiment. He's like, Raphael, I'll do you a favor. I'll do the experiment for you. Just wait. We just need six more months. Those were the, one of the, the, probably have the longest six months of my life. And why was it so difficult for me to wait those six months? Why? There's validation. But maybe what if I was wrong? Right? We would do research. We do the best we can. But there's no guarantee that we're going to be right. Even when we have all the results, well, there's no guarantee. So here I was. I didn't publish my paper. And it was six and a half years, waiting for the last six months. And then he says, we should be able to see a decrease from DD to the KK to the quad from two-point mutations to, to the four-point mutation. We should be able to see a, a downward trend. And then when he showed me the results, it was exactly how we predicted. So, once, so with the character development, before you get to the climax, we really don't know what's going to happen. Timon and Pumba, we don't know. Nala, we kind of start getting closer. Rafiki, we're getting closer. But once you pass the climax, you should be able to predict what happens next. And that's one of the key parts. After the climax, to be able to do experiments where you predict what happens next. And that's one of the strongest parts of science, and that makes it quite fulfilling as well. And then I bring it back to Pride Rock with EI5, CTD binding to EI4 and 2 beta. And that was my Pride Rock, and we published our paper in Cell Reports. And here, this was our first uh, manuscript where we intentionally implemented the uh, elements of narrative craft. So our protagonist is the C terminal domain of EIF5, my protagonist. Resolution is a form of an action verb, promotes. Uh, dynamic interplay is a conflict, because we didn't know which, listen, Timon and Pumba, or Nala is EIF1 and 2 beta. Which one do I listen to? And the star coding recognition is a scene that let us know it's on the ribosome part, uh, and a particular part of the ribosome. And also EIF1 and 2 beta are two antagonists. And star coding recognition, for those three words required experiments five through seven. And so that, um, uh, so for each word, it was almost one year for each of these words. But that was the stakes. And that um, without protein synthesis happening in your body thousands of uh, times per second, we, none of us would be here. And so I published a paper in Nature Immunology 2014, also describing this method, where you have results, increasing results, declension results, and protagonists but it's still centered around the protagonist. And your evidence, the most key part is you have to have your evidence and serves as your spine. So when the, uh, the gentleman says the structure, he was absolutely correct, but we'll need evidence for that structure. Then you have the beginning, middle, and end. And we start off with a 20,000 foot view, go very deep in the results, and then we go from very specific to the, back to the general. So we start off with Pride Rock, specific action, then we end up back at Pride Rock. And your storyline serves as a draft, and you bend that draft into a dramatic art. And basically, this is a logical staircase when you're submitting a grant to a, a federal agency, they want to learn, they want to be enlightened. When you, you publish a research video, a documentary, or publish a paper, the audience wants to be enlightened. And so, you do so much work. Some of you are doing your PhDs, or if some of you have done your PhDs, or if you're doing research, uh, you have a speaker and audience arc. And so 
basically, if you're a part of the audience, uh, are you supposed to do nothing, 0% of the work, or are you supposed to do 100%? And if you're a speaker, am I supposed to do all of the work and, or none of the work? And so typically, you can't put all the evidence that you have that you've worked with. If you're work, working on the video, there's so many director's cuts, you cannot put everything in there. If you do an article in journalism, you can't throw everything into the piece. But you find out what's the essential pieces. And if you use storytelling, you find the essential pieces. The, like Lion King was in Africa, but we don't know about, they didn't discuss evolution. They didn't discuss about the zebras. We didn't know much about the zebras or the other animals because we just, there was a logical narrative arc there. And so we want to be careful of a data dump. You don't want your video to just have nothing but a string of data. And that's not going to be fun for you or for the audience. And also to make sure that you're very simple. Because even with The Lion King, you start off with Pride Rock and you end at Pride Rock. And everything happened in the Serengeti. They didn't end up going to Texas. They didn't go anywhere else to South America. They stayed in the Pride Rock. And your audience will remember research centered on a protagonist. And your hypothesis and abstract, that just helps define the landscape and give you structure. And so I'm going to give you a, a couple of uh, uh, examples of a cancer therapeutic. Here we have protein synthesis. You have DNA, RNA going to protein. So here is this messenger RNA. So in order for you to have protein on your hair and protein in your bones and everywhere throughout your whole body, you will have a messenger RNA. You go from DNA to RNA to protein. Here's the messenger RNA, it needs to be converted to protein. And that's done by these proteins bringing it to a ribosome. And so what they want, naturally your body has in this body, doesn't keep making proteins all the time. If not, you will have all, we would have all the tumors. And so your, your protein synthesis is regulated. And so they want, the scientists at Harvard Medical School wanted to find a drug, this drug right here. You see these little circles, they're called benzene rings. They wanted to find an inhibitor that disrupted this interaction. And if you stop um, protein synthesis, then the goal is to stop protein synthesis in the tumor, and so those tumors would die. So if you need to build, uh, if you think of tumors as big buildings, uh, that uh, buildings would need bricks, this would stop the brick-making factory. And so here they found uh, this inhibitor, the EI4E and the 4G, inhibitor for EGI-1 drug. And so one of the hardest things that we have uh, in the field of science is to do is to identify that protagonist. Sometimes the protagonist is easy. Sometimes you're doing a study on a different aspect of whatever your research is. But how do you find out what the protagonist is? How do you know who's your protagonist? If the story is it's easy to see if somebody else does a story, but what about when you're crafting your own story and you're doing your own research, your own video? How do you know when there's so many different players and actors? How do you arrange them so that you know who's the protagonist? So now that you're, I, I'm standing before um, an audience of storytellers, here we have EI4G in the, gray, in, in the gray, and we have a drug, this space field molecule here. So how do we know who the protagonist is? So after I gave my talk to those European biophysicists, one of my first talks, and that didn't go over so well. So my boss, Gerhard Wagner, brings me to his office, and he knew I was traveling all over Europe and the United States giving talks on scientific storytelling. So he says, Raphael, I bring you to my office. Now I need you to tell me on this project who's the protagonist. And he, says, and he says, Mr. Storyteller, I want you to tell me. And he was being uh, facetious and joking, but he was serious. He says, tell me, I need to know. I have been working on this project for six years, and ever since 2007, I think it was. Uh, and so he was working on this for six years, and the last two years, he couldn't finish his paper. So how did he, he needed to know who the protagonist is. So now... I look at this video, this is the evidence that I had. I ask you, who's the protagonist? Is it the in gray or is it the space field drug molecule? So I ask you, who's the protagonist? And why? So not only to say who is the protagonist, but why that particular molecule is the protagonist. 
What's the central, one of the central definitions of that protagonist that we mentioned earlier? What must the protagonist go through? It goes through the conflict and it's changed, right? So the first thing I asked him, I said, well, I know your drug was a protagonist in the 2007 paper, but this is a new paper. I said, so does, he says, I think, he says, I think the protagonist is the drug. I said, well, does the drug, does it split open? Does those circles on those rings, do they break? Do they change? He's like, no, by nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, and he's the world expert in biomolecules in the whole world. He says, no, it doesn't change at all. So that tells me that if it doesn't change, it's the antagonist, because the only thing that's changed in this experiment is the protagonist. I said, so can you tell me more about the protein, the I4E? He says, well, it's funny you ask me, because when it's alone, but when it binds the drug, it's, it changes. You have an extension of alpha helix of this protein. So not only does it change, but it kicks off a molecule called the 4G. The 4G is there, and then when the drug binds, it kicks off the the EI4G. And so that's what I told him. I said, well, if that's the case, the 4E is your, drug, is your protagonist, and your drug is your antagonist. And, and he says, well, they can't be the case. And I said, well, do you want to use the method, or do you want to continue your method? And, um, and so then he, we, we worked. He, felt, he subscribed to the method, and we published the paper in the Proceedings National Academy of Sciences. And there's no good deed that goes unpunished. I ended up making on the manu uh, getting on the manuscript, but we had to beat the competitors, and so uh, we needed to do 50-point mutations to do all the validation after the climax. We needed to do the validation, so guess what? I had to go into the lab for about three to four weeks and grow liters and liters of bacteria and protein just for this study. Um, but we beat, and the nice thing about this, we ended this story and if they waited a little bit longer, uh, six more weeks, uh, their competitors published the paper, which they had to cite this one. So story, scientific storytelling helps you finish the manuscript, finish your video on time and before others. Now I'm going to tell you a little quick story about herpes viruses. And herpes viruses is like true love. It lasts forever. <laughs> so inside of every cell, there's a cell membrane, and inside there's a nucleus. And you have herpes virus inside the capsules, and this is where you have an empty, there's no DNA inside, but these have DNA. And then they bud through the, 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 the nucleus and eventually into the outer nuclear membrane and then eventually outside the cell, and that's how you'll see herpes viral sores. And then the human cytomegalovirus is a herpes virus. It causes uh, infectious mononucleosis at times. Um, and, but here you have a protagonist, a UL50 protein. And that's anchored into the membrane of the, um, uh, of the nuclear membrane. And UO53 can only be bound to the membrane if it's uh, bound to UO50, your protagonist. So this antagonist needs to be bound to this protein. And in the mouse cytomegaloviruses, a mouse version, you have the same thing with the M50. And so here's our protagonist, uh, M50. They found the structure for it. And they started identifying where M53 binds to M50. And you can see it right here. So they do point mutations here. And they can see, again, it binds really well. But when they mutate it, you can disrupt this interaction. So if you don't have a pretty curve, that means it doesn't bind together. And so if we disrupt this interaction, if it's on the nuclear membrane, you can see it here normally right here. And this is UL53. You can see it in red. And then, but if you knock out the gene completely, then UL50 um, if you knock out the gene completely, then UL53, which is labeled in red, will go all over the nuclear membrane, the nucleus. And if you just do a point mutation in this area, then it's just as if you knock out the whole gene. You switch one amino acid, it's as if you switch, knock out the whole gene. We were able to do that. And then we have this long title. So this is my collaborator, Howard Bobby Altenari. He was one of the first people that told me, Raphael, after our paper was rejected to cell, which is the the highest impact journal in biomedical science, he says, use your storytelling method. And so we were able to publish our, our paper. But then he does, he sits right behind me, and he's working on his title. And I was like, well, that title's kind of long. Do you need that, all these words? And what are two words here that just aren't necessary here that we could just remove? What are two words that aren't necessary right here? 
Does anyone see him? Which one? Which one? Two words here that aren't necessary. And they do put the word structure, which I don't think is necessary for a story, but that brings it to a higher impact journal. So in that part, it was a matter of uh, getting it through the publication. But here, that is. You don't even need those words. So when you're constructing your titles, you want to make sure you, you, you're very efficient with your words because you need to deliver it in seven seconds, five seconds, as quickly as you can. And so, um, so that is you don't need. And I told him, I said, why did you publish that? You should have let me see the title right before. I would have told you. I said, so don't worry, Hari Babu Atanari. I'll just go around doing my talks. I'll incorporate this into my talk. And he said, no, no, don't do that. Don't, please don't do that. And I said, well, excuse me. <clears throat> it's okay. I'll, um, I'll just give you credit for it. And he's like, no, don't do that. But he's my friend, so we get along very well. So he took it in stride. And here is a paper when I taught this in Austria. It's a beautiful paper, one of the most beautiful papers I've read that's put into a story. Um, and here is non over peptides, the protagonist, and over toxicity is conflict. Causes uh, is the um, resolution. Antibiotic-associated colitis, it's both the scene and the stakes. But what's missing here? What's missing here out of those six elements that we talked about in the beginning? What do we have missing? And, and once we noticed, I couldn't do a critique on this manuscript. It was beautiful. I had jet lag. I was up to 2 in the morning trying to write a critique on this in Austria. But then I, I couldn't. I said, I said, did I finally meet my match? Is this the perfect paper? And, but I, my American skepticism was, like, I don't believe in perfection. This can't be possible. Have I finally met the perfect paper here in Austria? But... Then I looked over and I said, I said, let me use a storytelling method. Found the, end, the, end, the protagonist, conflict, scene, resolution, resolution, mistakes, but there's no antagonist. I said, oh, then all of a sudden I felt this righteous indignation. I woke up at two in the morning without even any coffee and I aggressively started typing on my laptop writing. And so if we don't have an antagonist, what does that mean? Then we don't have the mechanism. If they don't know where this peptide binds to, that tells me in scientific terms we don't have a mechanism. And so that's uh, quite telling, and then we were able to see that. Here in this scientific manuscript, we have uh, two protagonists, EIF1A and EIF5. That's like Hansel and Gretel. And we were able to put EIF1 was our antagonist, and scanning pre-initiation complex is a scene in the stakes. Now this one, uh, George Whitesides, is the most cited scientist in the world. He's a chemist, the most cited chemist in the world. He's at Harvard University. And his postdocs, they could not put this paper together. So we spent four hours in Starbucks in, in Harvard Square. And this, this particular Starbucks, which is recently closed, so I was a bit saddened by that last semester. But here, one of the hardest things was that it's a process called magnetic levitation. I never knew that we could put a process or, or a device as a protagonist. And then we have protagonists here separates the resolution, mixtures the conflict, crystal polymorphs are your antagonists. And here again, we publish this paper in Nature Communication using the same method. And here's an Austrian scientist here, um, and he was studying how paper binds, and what he needed was a resolution. He didn't have resolution in this title, so he put it quantifies, and then he was able to get his paper through into cell reports. And here's a, a story uh, in Langmuir, and he had a, this is a Professor Martin Thubo, he had my book, and he says, gives me a manuscript without a title in the abstract, and says, let's put, Raphael, I want you to put a story to it. I said, well, how do I do that? I don't see a title in the abstract. And my book is sitting on his desk. I said, did you even read the book? He says, yes. I started on chapter three, where, you know, with the results and the discussion. I said, no, no, you need to start chapter one and two, where it goes into the title in the abstract, and... He needed to name his protagonist. His protagonist was invisible. And so we knew about this process, but it was invisible. I said, you need to name that protagonist. And he says, and he was very reluctant at first, and then he named a slice, and this paper allowed him to land a job at the Iowa State University, which is a top 30 engineering program in the, in the country, uh, the United States. And this is someone that attended one of the workshops. They published in 
proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences. And this is a professor at, um, um, at the University of Santa Cruz. And they were able to use this uh, method to publish their papers. And here is a, a German, um, uh, Karsten Bohl, uh, with uh, Frank uh, Mücklich. And here's your protagonist. Uh, we, he caught me in the elevator after, I, I mean, at, at, the, at the hotel, and I was leaving to, the, to uh, catch a train. And, and, and maybe the German trains aren't as uh, punktlich as the Swiss trains, but they're pretty much on time. And I was afraid that I was going to miss my train. And he says, no, give me 10 minutes. And we did this in the hotel lobby. Uh, your protagonist, the resolution, your two antagonists, and your scene and stakes. And here's another paper published in Nature Biomedical Engineering. And this is the final story. We have Harry Barber Arthanari. He publishes paper in Nature, which is Nature, Cell, and Science are the top journals in biomedicine. And here, I couldn't identify the protagonist. I said, he says, I use your method, but I still can't find the protagonist. But I said, I like this story. But his protagonist was throughout the whole story. And he was able to publish his, uh, his story. And he named his protagonist iKicks, like the iPhone. And he's gone all over the world to tell his story. And now this paper allowed him to become a professor at Harvard Medical School. And so what I learned over this journey with scientific storytelling, not only is it important to publish and to perish, or, or perish, but what I learned is how to end stories. Once uh, not, uh, Simba's son, daughter is raised up, the story is over, and we end that story. And we can catalyze your research through scientific storytelling, and you want to tell your story and have that global impact. And so here, to make this Hall of Fame, people have published their manuscripts or worked here. Um, you see people from all over the world, from Denmark, uh, the U.S., is from Israel, the, and we have uh, Professor Sebastian uh, Hiller. Uh, he's uh, at the University Tet of Basel in Biosyntum, and also, and he studied here at the Etaha. Professor Gerhard Wagner, who studied here at the Etaha, but is at Harvard Medical School, and we all, they all use this method, and, and it's actually being widely incorporated all throughout the United States now with top labs. And so you're in the right space now to, be, to really go to the next step and take it from manuscripts to the video. And I'm interested in, in attending the rest of the sessions and um, learning more about this new, have this new discussion on videos and also uh, to practice my German. And so when it matters most, people say, do you always have to tell the story? Well, if it, if it matters a lot, then the best way is, is to tell the story, a logical one. And I'd like to thank the Institute of Performing Arts and the Zurich University in the Arts and Cast Audiovisual Visual Media Department of Design, uh, Professor Dr. Martin Zimper, Leah Clowell, and the cast team. And I'm a storyteller, not an artist, so the person who did all the, the drawings is Dr. Kendra Lee. She was gracious enough to do the drawings. So thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate um, uh, working with you. Um, thank you very much, Rafael. Do you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, we're going to open for a couple of questions. Um, I would have one first question first. You're telling your uh, storytelling and you're telling biological stories. Though um, I'm also a researcher, but I never have read any um, biology scientific uh, publication. I was wondering if uh, through your methods or maybe a more development, would it be possible to write scientific um, results in a way that it can be understood by people who haven't been studying exactly the same discipline as you to open it more to a broader audience? And if there are attempts to do that, to do something in between the purely scientific world and an audience that is interested in scient actual scientific results. Yes, um, that's a very good point. And so this is a movement in the United States of scientific communication where they'll take very rigorous scientific work, like stuff that we, um, the publications, and present it for the, the, the public. 
but you, without all the scientific terms. And these are also papers that are published. And, and they, what, what's important is that they can still use the scientific storytelling method to actually extract and, and tell these stories. And so I go, you know, um, Boston is a hub for uh, pharmaceutical and biotech companies. So I often work with biotech um, to, to work with the researchers so I'll, they'll show their research and they'll present it in a way where they have to do an audio presentation with a video, but not to, to, so that the business people can understand, like the CEO, the vice presidents. Some of them are not even scientists, but they need to present their research in a way that has impact. If you're studying a, a disease in neuroscience, like let's say Parkinson's, what is his impact? What is his role? What's the bottom line? And so, yes, um, we use this method for not only scientific manuscripts, but also for publications and communicating the science and for non-scientists as well. Thank you. Um, someone has a question? Yes. Yes, yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I appreciate it very much, but I was a little bit confused that you did not mention that every scientific paper is a story. I mean, like, if we look to the history of scientific papers in the last 500 years, they developed, and they kind of build up a certain narrative that you are referring to, which is the abstract and the, uh, the so-called, what is it called, the um, uh, introduction methods, IMRET format, right, introduction right. method, result, and discussion. That's in storytelling. I mean, it's not really telling what is happening in the lab, but it's another story. Um, so there is a history to it, uh, but I wonder, because this is a conference on um, video uh, narratives, so I would, would like to know what is your idea, how could that, these, these uh, thesis or these kind of ideas you have feed into the format of video where it's the opposite situation than you have because you're describing a situation where it's, you know, like you have the safe data, you have a safe publication format, nobody will ever doubt a formula that is printed, an image, but the moment you go into moving image, everybody is scared, people think it's, uh, it's art and not science anymore. So, so it might be the opposite of what you're describing. Instead of uh, putting in, uh, we don't need, the narr maybe we don't need a protagonist anymore because this might look less scientific or whatever. You know, like what kind of advices do you give us uh, on the more um, non-scientific format of video? You know, I, you know with, I've been doing this for a while and, but I've seen the landscape of science change as well. And so now, um, that video that I showed with the protagonist and antagonist, it's impossible to present that in a 2D paper. So there's no way to get that until you see the video. And so now, and with the advent of big data, it's impossible to, the, the, the written word of a manuscript doesn't work anymore. And most scientists don't even read the manuscripts. When I query the scientists and ask how many of them read the manuscripts in their field, very few even read their, their their peers' publications. So I think this is the time now for um, new mediums to actually come into play. But with those new mediums, I think it's really important to also have um, a standard. And also, if it's scientific storytelling and with the video, and I think it's still important to have some aspects of that, uh, that work well in, like you mentioned, the I'm Red method with the introduction, methods, results, and discussion. You know, those are essential, but maybe those could be done in a video format where you can, things can move a lot quicker. But also, it's essential now for even, uh, for scientists to get their funding, not only in the US, but also in Europe, that they need to be able to tell their story within two minutes. And a manuscript, you're not gonna be able to read that in two minutes, and so they need to really be able to do that. So I, I think video is a quick way to do that, but then also, to really explore that, I think that we, you know, the Gustav Freitag, uh, you know, Martin uh, presented, is over hundreds of years. And so I think if we, if we use video and we use other elements, I don't know of another way to do it without aspects of a protagonist, antagonist, conflict, and scene resolution. Because I think for me, for everything I've seen, both in literature 
in all the graduate courses I've taken at Harvard, graduate school in English and British and American literature, without these elements, then the story kind of falls apart. And you really need to, an end point. So it helps you find the end point. And so maybe this discussion could probably be, you know, also revisit during the panel. And I would love to hear what other panelists say as well, because this is a very good point that you bring. How much do we need to bring in from the scientific field? And if you're doing other things besides video. But I think to be quite compelling and believable, it's something with evidence and data, um, then I think that's, that changes people's behavior. So I think that's still quite important if you want your video to have an impact and to you know, change people's lives. But thank you for that question. And I look forward to the discussion. Uh, maybe you can raise that question again during the panel. It's a very good uh, point. Yes, I just wanted to add that this is exactly the question that we want to raise during the panel when all the or speakers will sit here to discuss new possible uh, scientific formats. More questions? Yeah, um, also from my side, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, to, um, presentation. Um, it seems to me that you um, uh, do a lot of uh, quantitative research. So my question would be, um, would you say, um, yeah, would we need a different model or would the same model work for also for a qualitative approach? Of, of for qualitative? Yes, uh, I gave a talk, this talk at the London School of Economics in the International Relations Department where it's less quantitation there and it's very hard to even have a resolution because if you have two states and that are war for hundreds of years or even thousands of years, there's not going to be a resolution, right? And so just like the Americans, uh, I don't know if like the, the De Democrats and Republicans are ever going to have a re resolution, but, but maybe there could be a hierarchical structure or framework that you can have that could be logical, that could be, that, that could serve as your resolution, but it works really well for them and they were able to publish their, their dissertation using this method as well. I think it's just, um, we've used it for some of the quantitative, but I don't think that it's only meant for the quantitative. You know, we, I brought it in to address some of the, the, the rigorous biomedical research, but we use this for elevated pitches. Um, a lot of startup companies use that to just talk about their research within 30 seconds to get investor funding. And so you can use it in each in, in different ways and different venues, but I think just distilling down to the protagonist, antagonist conflict, seeing the resolution and stakes, you, know, you can quite effectively tell a story, just like The Lion King, um, which is qualitative and is not a quantitative aspect, but it's still the basic principles. And so um, that's also a very good question. But I think if it works, I think it's the more so the proof of principle. If it works for the most quantitative, then I think throughout history it's been shown already to work for the qualitative with a lot of fiction and narrative already and novels that are already published over um, hundreds of years. And so I think that um, it shouldn't be a problem. But I think we should still be mindful that what's the evidence, because even in like in fiction, in classical British and American fictions, if there's a protagonist, there's always the evidence why this person acts a certain way. And the evidence is normally found in the exposition, the first chapter, um, and is also found in the last chapter, so um, with that resolution. It, normally things don't just happen because, and even in Shakespeare's play, this someone has to introduce that problem and, and, then, and leave evidence. And then with that, you put the evidence together, and then you'll have your resolution, so. But that's also a very good question. At the, at the very beginning, you said that you want to bring together two different realms, the realm of the scientific world and the fiction art world, whatever. <clears throat> now, there's one thing, if you use this kind of method to bring in a structure, and to, to make it more readable or consumable or understandable. But on the one hand side, we are talking about scientific evidence. So we're talking about objectivity. Uh, we write these papers in order that somebody can repeat the experiments we do. Right. So <clears throat> it's all about uh, really making sense. Now in the world of art, and we relate to fiction, it's about making things up, trying to make it catchy and uh, when we transpose this method now to moving images, I would rather, well, um, ask you to use the term a documentary 
and not a fiction because it's not about making things, you know, and we have this problem in the scientific world also that they come up with fake uh, oh. research and uh, make it more attractive for readers and to get, you know, more uh, attention. So my question is that, do you see this danger and where does it stop? Uh, and the, the, I do you one. see this danger by using this method? Because it also mm. invites people to make things, you know, to, to, to polish a little more their results, to make them more catchy, attractive, and that could also be a danger for the scientific research. The, um, uh, I, I think, you know, here, I, that was an excellent question, but I think in, in exposition that um, uh, Professor Zimper mentioned, where you have an antagonist, and that third antagonist judges, um, with that antagonist in your story, you have the other antagonists where will help judge and serve as the moral center. Um, I think that the audience gets to see and make their own judgment. And I think that um, whether you're in the science realm or it's a documentary or it's any um, other kind of stories that you read or videos that you see, that I think the, most of the time, like the, the director or the writer is inviting you to judge whether the facts are real and you're presenting the evidence. And so I don't see the danger. I think we've heard that um, initially in the scientific field that there was this danger, but I think the danger is more so with not using a narrative method or some type of framework um, because I, I think the, the, the logical aspects of the narrative and Gustav Freitag's uh, uh, logical dramatic arc it's, it provides a framework that helps you understand and resolve and it's something that we can relate to. And I, I, I haven't uh, seen in the scientific field where um, someone makes things up. Now, just like in fiction, you can make something up, but in science, you still need to present the results. And if in the scientific field, if you um, make a claim, you will have to present the evidence and allow the evidence to be shared. If you do a mouse genetic cell line, that cell line needs to be uh, available to others so they can test it. Um, but I think also in, in the documentaries or in other aspects, if, if someone produces a film or a documentary, then I think that invites other people to be critical of it. And I think the, the, in the field of humanities, that it, it really is even more so inviting for people to judge and to judge the accuracy or the veracity of um, what you're producing. And I think that makes it even stronger. And some of the best documentaries are have evidence in them and then make it really quite compelling so that um, can change people's behavior. Even skeptics even could believe. But it's, it's difficult to make it up to fabricate. It, it makes it quite complicated, but it's, it's hard. Um, but I believe in the system of logic and reasoning where what, if you can apply that to whatever narrative that is, um, then... Um, I think that would be helpful. And even if in the film, in the area of literature, if a, those classical books, uh, those that aren't logical seem to fall apart, the ones that stand the test of time and become classics, um, then those books are, are typically, because they're logically written and they can stand the test of time as well. But I don't have the exact answer for that, but I still, maybe I'm idealistic and I believe you know, and the narrative, and, I'm, and I believe in the logical aspects of that that apply for science and reasoning, but also for the humanities. I don't see that division. I see it, you know, we're all logical human beings, whether you're a scientist or a humanist, who we all use ration, uh, rationale and um, we uh, use the logic we have. It's not like you throw away your logic when you're a humanist or if you throw away your reasoning if you're a scientist. But maybe some of us do, some scientists may do that. This, but um, and overall, I think um, typically those results won't last long term. Um, you were referring to classical dramatic closed forms of storytelling, which is very interesting. Did you also look at epic forms? Not open, not closed forms, open dramatical uh. forms, or you know, uh, referring to classical Hollywood cinema, it would be referring then uh, to art cinema, open structures, multi perspectives, or or uh, multi protagonists, or uh, yeah, 
How do you do you look into that forms as well? Um, not for scientific storytelling. I didn't apply that, but not to say that it wouldn't work. And I think when I uh, presented this in front of uh, some humanists and theater uh, individuals, well, you know, it's a simple. This is like the probably the simplest form of storytelling. They're more complicated and open ended, as you mentioned, and it makes it quite difficult to follow. But I think that. Uh, even in those areas, there's probably some logic and reasoning uh, in there as well. But um, and maybe the resolution may be further out, or maybe the resolution, you know, is transferred not in the story but transferred to the audience, where the audience are left with uh, some conflict, and maybe that'll inspire them to change. And that's where some different aspects. But I haven't explored that um, for the purpose for scientists publishing their research. Um, we use a simple closed system because it's just not that much time. So some of what you mentioned takes more time. And I think in the format for the traditional scientific papers, it's not that much time. And actually, we're going away from that. Even that, it takes about four to five hours to read a scientific manuscript. Now, scientists just don't have the time to do that with all the thousands of papers published. So right now, they go into smaller 30 seconds and two minute clips and, and little videos like the one I showed to really capture in a few seconds. And so those are very simple aspects of narrative. But I would, I would you know, um, and, and, you know, be open to seeing more and learning more about different aspects of the, the extended versions of storytelling and the multiple protagonists. And the multiple protagonists get quite difficult, but there still seems to be a, a logical thread through some of those uh, novels where they do have um, multiple uh, protagonists. And those, and those stories are quite rich and um, meaningful as well. One last quick question. One. Just a follow up remark. Just a follow up remark sure. to that question and your answer. Um, in science, um, the usual formula for what you're referring to is uh, this aspect needs further research. Oh. And that is a very uh, common sentence uh, yeah, that, yeah. that would invite, in a sense, open-ended uh, storytelling and even transmedia storytelling where you can branch off in various directions. Yeah, and thank you for doing that, saying that because that also lets me know is that um, your research, like if somebody has a research lab, they will publish a paper, but that's just one part of their story, but then they'll have different aspects in the same field and use different techniques, and then they'll have multiple papers coming out with different protagonists. But then, overall, that lab is still telling one story. Um, and, and I think that might be something uh, similar to that, but uh, yes, it would need more further research. So thank you for that answer. I appreciate that. And thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure, and uh, I look forward to learning from, from you throughout the rest of the day. Thank you very much.